Just a quick message to say, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. I've used it for the first time. It's free. It allows you to record and edit podcasts from your phone or computer. Anchor have distributed my podcast so you can hear it anywhere on like Spotify, Apple Podcasts and many more. There's no minimum listenership. You can make money from your podcast. Everything in one simple place. It's so easy to use. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi everyone, I'm John Offord. I'm a broadcaster based in the UK and welcome to Different Minds, a podcast series that looks at neurodiversity, the different ways our brains can work and interpret information. Today we're going to talk about autism and neurodiversity. I'm honoured to be joined by Steve Silberman, the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. Neurotribes was awarded the Samuel Johnson Prize in 2015 and has received wide acclaim from both the scientific and the popular press. The book has been described as the most complete history of autism and it has been recommended as a welcome ray of clarity, sanity and optimism. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. What a wonderful description. (laughs) I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, John. So, Steve, tell us a bit more about the book. How did Neurotribes come about? Well, in uh, back in the year 2000, I was on a boat in Alaska with more than 100 computer programmers. And um, I noticed that, you know, they were brilliant, fascinating people. And many of them were also quite socially awkward. And one of them, who was sort of the star of this cruise that I was on, it was called the Geek Cruise, was the inventor of a widely used programming language called Perl. And I asked him uh, if I could come interview him at his home in Silicon Valley. His name is Larry Wall. Uh, And he said, yeah, sure. By the way, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And so this was back in 2000. Like most people, including autism specialists at the time, I mistakenly believed that autism was very, very rare. Uh, the estimates of prevalence were something like one in 10,000 or something. Um, so I thought, oh, that's interesting, but I didn't think much about it. But then about six months later, I was doing another story for Wired on another technologically very adept family in Silicon Valley. And uh, the sister-in-law of the woman I was profiling said, uh, when I asked her if I could come interview her at her home, she said, yeah, sure. By the way, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And I thought, yeah, that's odd. And so I was telling that story to a friend of mine at my favorite neighborhood cafe here in San Francisco. And a woman at the next table said, oh my God, do you realize what's happening? And I said, what's happening? And she said, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. Something terrible is happening to our children. You know, so I heard like, you know, chords of doom or whatever. And, uh, but I was a science reporter. So I thought, well, is this really true? You know, like my, my, I didn't just get horrified. I thought, is this really true? So I went and, and wrote uh, this article, The Geek Syndrome. Uh, and it suggested to me that what was going on was not what everybody was telling me, which was that it was an epidemic caused by vaccines or, or, uh, well, they didn't have Wi Fi then, but, you know, screens or, silicon and the water (laughs) like i heard a million rumors about what was causing this alleged epidemic and it looked like to me uh what was going on was that people with autistic traits were finding uh a sort of agreeable environment and work environment for themselves in silicon valley that high-tech communities had become like sanctuaries for people with autistic traits And then when people with autistic traits met one another, uh, which was easier now than or easier then than it ever had been in history because of, um, you know, sort of online communication and email and whatnot, um, that if they had kids, the kids might be more profoundly autistic than the parents. And that was a theory developed by Simon Baron Cohen at Cambridge as well. Um, And so and in fact, I should say. Simon has a new book coming out called The Pattern Seekers, which talks about the role that people with autistic traits have played in the advancement of science, technology, and art. And it's a very provocative book. Uh, So 
I started to think that that's what was going on, that it wasn't some environmental toxin or something like that. Um, but then in the years that followed Geek Syndrome, whenever the subject of autism came up online, even if the news story that was being linked to had nothing to do with um, vaccines, vaccines were always the primary obsession of the commenters. And, you know, if you suggested that vaccines were not responsible, you'd be called a shill for big pharma. Um, and, you know, I've written articles that were very um, critical of big pharma for Wired, so it was hardly a shill. Um, but at some point I got the feeling that something had gone wrong in autism history, that somehow we had lost or forgotten uh, or been denied access to the information that explained why the diagnoses started rising so steeply in the early 90s. And so that's what I became determined to find out, and I did find out. So would it be fair to say, Steve, that when you broke the story of the rising rates of autism diagnosis in Silicon Valley, you saw it as a problem and you've since changed your mind? Yes, I did, because there was, you know, in um, the disability rights community, they talk about two opposing models of disability. One is the so-called social model, which talks about how if you live in a wheelchair, if, you, if you're in a town with no uh, wheelchair ramps or accessible bathrooms or curb cuts or whatever, you're screwed. You're highly disabled. But if you live in a town that has those accommodations, you're fine. You can get around great. And the, you know, sort of the opposing model is the so-called medical model, which locates the disability entirely in the person. The person has a deficit or a flaw. If we could fix it, they wouldn't be disabled anymore, et cetera. And so, Back then, in 2000, the autism was only viewed through the medical model. Um, there were the very first stirrings of what would eventually become a, a full-fledged autistic culture, sort of an autistic subculture. And I noted that in my article, The Geek Syndrome, this wonderful uh, web page built by a person named Laura Tisanchik, who satirized uh, like American Psychiatric Association diagnostic pages. Uh, and what she did was she she said um, neurotypicality, i.e. being non-autistic, is, in, you know, sadly incurable. You know, the, <laughs> the symptoms are like compulsive socializing, constant small talk, you know. And I, th I thought that was hilarious. And I thought that was like the first glimpse of something other than the medical model that I saw. And so, yes, in 2000, when I started writing The Geek Syndrome, uh, uh, I, or 2001, actually, I um, was within, still within the medical model. So, uh, I, you know, but gradually, as I did my research, I realized that what I was writing, even though I was a science reporter, what I was writing was not really, you know, like a medical book or a technical book about this quote-unquote disorder, a word I never use, I realized I was writing about a tribe of people that was discovering itself, discovering its true prevalence in the community, which is not rare at all. In fact, autism is very common. Um, and discovering that a lot of their problems had nothing to do with autism. They were not symptoms of their autism. They were symptoms of a society that was failing to meet their needs. And so that's what Neurotribes describes. And that's fair to say that's the reason why autism, you were, you were so interested in autism, essentially, because of what you just described. Well, no, I mean, I, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, for one thing, I mean, this is, I'll put the goofiest one first. Um, for one thing, I find a lot of autistic people incredibly charming and endearing. And it's partly because uh, they're very, very honest. And um, to be blunt and disclosive, I grew up in a family with alcoholic parents. And so in my family, the truth was a rare and precious thing. And uh, I heard lies around me all the time. And so when I came across this tribe of people, I mean, I'm not saying that autistic people can't lie. They do. Sure. Some autistic people lie a lot. But sure. for the most part, 
autistic people are, are uh, strikingly honest and earnest and no BS and, you know, just sort of get to yeah. the point. And I, I, I found that really refreshing. Um, so it was not just, you know, that, but it was also like, I found myself liking autistic people. And I also related to them because when I was uh, in high school, you know, the Bible of psychiatry in America is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, which I talk a lot yes. about in the book. When I was in high school, I was in the DSM because I was gay. And, you know, mm. gayness was considered a, a mental disorder. You could be put in an institution for kissing your boyfriend. This is really true. You could be arrested. It was also illegal, you know. So, and in my high school years, I saw gay activists do sit-ins in the offices of the APA and do street demonstrations and say, screw that. We're gay and happy. Gay is good, you know. And in fact, the DSM eventually changed. And it wasn't because they discovered that, ooh, homosexuality is not, after all, a mental disorder. You know, it was because of these street actions and confrontations and demand that um, uh, that gay people are full human beings. And so once I saw like Laura Tisanchik's, you know, satirical web page, I thought, oh, there's something going on here, you know, and then and then I I, I plunged in uh, more more wholeheartedly once I started researching neurotribes. What is the, the key point then from from your book? That autistic people are full human beings, that um, autism, instead of being a mistake of nature, is an expression of the diversity of nature. Uh, in a rainforest, a diversity of um, animals and plants helps that community of living things thrive and endure, even in the face of changing conditions. So what I would say is that the, the diversity of human minds helps the human community thrive and endure in the face of changing conditions. And even though she sort of appeared on the world stage um, after my book came out, Greta Thunberg was like, you know, a, a prophecy. <laughs> it's like she is, you know, she's autistic for sure. She's proud of that. And she is totally committed to not just speaking the truth, but doing practical organizing to save the world from catas catastrophic cataclysm, which we're facing and which we're now all distracted from uh, dealing with because we have a nearly a fascist uh, in the White House, and he will be a fascist if Trump is reelected. Um, and so what Greta expresses is the fact that Sometimes the ideas and the motivation and the energy that could literally save the world from destruction are located in the different minds of autistic people or people with dyslexia or ADHD. I would say that's the main point of my book. So I read somewhere that you cried while you were writing the book. Is that true, Steve, and why? Oh, it, yeah, I did cry. Um, well, for about a year, what I was investigating was Hans Asperger's clinic. And Hans Asperger uh, launched a clinic, or he didn't launch it, but he, was, he worked in a clinic uh, that before World War II and before the rise of the Nazis was an extremely progressive place. Um, they uh, treated autistic people, autistic kids, who were kind of at the end of the rope of what society would allow them to do, like they'd often been sent there by the juvenile courts or uh, after being expelled from multiple schools, their parents had no idea what to do with them. Asperger and his colleagues, particularly two Jewish colleagues, Ani Weiss and George Frankel, uh, worked out a very humanistic model of um, sort of an environment in which these kids could come into their full humanity. Then, of course, uh, when the Nazis took over, and marched over uh, uh, from Germany in 1938, uh, Asperger's employers were either already Nazis or became full-on Nazis. Um, I uh, watched as this group of people who had been doing well 
uh, before the Nazis took over were then eventually sent to be exterminated and and uh, were treated horribly. And so it was writing about uh, the atrocities uh, during World War II committed against not just autistic people, but all disabled people and homosexuals as well. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the most frightening things about the era we're in now, I don't know how much of this happens in the UK, but in America, it's become um, very glib about, you know, quote unquote, disabled people, elderly people, or people with pre existing conditions being somehow expendable in COVID. You know, like if you start talking about, well, actually, you know, nearly 190,000 Americans have died of COVID. Then, you know, you have people say, well, they were elderly. They were old enough to die. They were disabled. You know, they're a waste of resources. That is Nazi talk. It's straight up Nazi talk. And it didn't take five minutes for it to become all over the, you know, the social media once COVID came along. Like, uh, I saw people who I never would have expected uh, being so dismissive of the lives of, of these people. And so, you know, I've learned since my book came out, unfortunately, how rapidly a society can turn against its neighbors that need the most support. But so I would be writing Neurotribes and I was actually listening to, um, I would listen over and over to a piece of music written by one of my favorite composers a guy named Steve Reich, and uh, he's a modern composer. His masterpiece is called Music for 18 Musicians. But he wrote a piece called The Daniel Variations for Daniel Pearl, who was the Jewish reporter from the Wall Street Journal who was made to confess that he was Jewish um, and then beheaded on a, on a you know, sort of an ISIS propaganda video. And so he before he was beheaded, he said, my name is Daniel Pearl. I'm a Jewish American. And what Steve Reich did, like, you know, it's the most horrible thing you can think of, really. But what Steve Reich did was he turned Daniel's last statements uh, and Daniel's love of playing the violin into a triumphant chorus of life-affirming, uh, you know, life-affirming validation. Uh, and I would, so I would listen to that write the chapter about the Holocaust, and weep. Wow, well, how powerful. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So obviously you, you, you're talking about the history of autism there, and obviously that's what you cover in your book then. So is it is it fair to say that the the foundational ideas of autism emerged in a society that strove for the, for the exact opposite of neurodiversity? Oh, yeah, I would say that. And in fact, I would say that um, the uh, Asperger statements that I quote uh, in the book were he you know he saw what was coming and they were an attempt to save at least certain members of that community and that you know that's a subject of much debate right now because he you know he yeah. was not speaking up for people who could not fulfill function in society and so you know he was in a sense working within a system that was uh, an intolerable system however i will point out that people who uh, declined to work within the system were killed. Uh, a group of medical students uh, at that time who called themselves the White Rose came out against euthanasia and were beheaded publicly in a public square. And so Asperger might have felt that he could do more good uh, and save more lives working within the system. Um, and I will say two of the people who evidently agreed with him about that were his Jewish colleagues uh, George Frankel and Annie Weiss, uh, what hardly anyone knows is that, yes, they were forced to leave um, Austria uh, by the Nazis, as I write about in my book in, in great depth. I was the first person to ever write about them, actually. Um, and they were key in developing the concepts that would later influence um, Lorna Wing and uh, uh even you know early autistic other autistic commentators um, to come up with the concept that Judy Singer, who you interviewed on your show, um, would 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 coin the word neurodiversity to describe. Um, but what what hardly anyone knows is that Asperger and the Fra and the Frankels they got married eventually um, stayed in touch through the war. 
uh, I've read those letters. They do not sound like two Jews in exile writing to a confirmed Nazi. In fact, they, they all on both sides um, talk about the Nazi era as a nightmare. And George and Ani went back to uh, uh, Vienna to consider starting another clinic with Asperger immediately after the war, like within months after the war ended. So, um, you know, while Asperger's complicity is definitely worthy of discussion, it's still being debated. Um, but it, it is, it's not unreasonable to say that those concepts developed by Asperger, Frankel, and Weiss were developed in a society that was on its way towards mass extermination of uh, autistic. And I mean, they didn't have the word autistic yet, except in Asperger's clinic. But, um, and in fact, I once looked at um, a chart of the disabilities of the people who were killed. And two of the biggest categories were epileptic and schizophrenic. And I think that autistic people probably would have been uh, judged as falling in one or the other uh, category. Yeah. So, Steve, so as you touch on there, the, the, there's possibly, you know, the, there is some controversy around Asperger there. And, and I just wondered if you could just tell us a bit more, more about who he was as, as a person and, and what his role was in the, uh, you know, in, in the development and recognition of, of autism as we know it today. Well, he related to outsiders because he was an outsider himself. And he, uh, you know, had these curiously uh, intense interests as a child in uh, a certain poet and certain composers. Uh, so he was an eccentric, I would say. Um, and he was, he was, you know, sort of beguiled by other eccentrics. Um, and then what, the, what Asperger, Frankel, and Weiss developed was really a way to, um, see autistic people as having lots of potential if they got the right kinds of support. Meanwhile, in America, uh, Leo Connor, who was sort of, um, you know, uh, the other person who early, early on codified autism, Leo Connor, you know, very quickly decided that institutionalization was the only way to go uh, for uh, his autistic patients. Whereas, um, Asperger and his colleagues were devoted to uh, not long-term institutionalization, but a couple of weeks in the clinic where the kid could restore his or her self-confidence, could learn how to interact with other children, um, could uh, do creative stuff like writing plays and, and whatnot. And Asperger saw, he wrote about how uh, parents who instead of discouraging uh, the kids' intensely focused interests, encouraging them and encouraging uh, the use of that special interest to become a platform for creativity and curiosity could be a stepping stone into a, uh, a happy and productive future life. So those were two, you know, kind of quite opposed um, uh, views of autism. And now, of course, uh, the way we think of autistic people is much closer to what Asperger and his Jewish colleagues uh, came up with in the beginning. Um, and in fact, there's going to be uh, a publication in the next month or so, I believe, of um, some articles from uh, Asperger's former colleagues and patients defending him against the belief that he was a fervent Nazi or something. Um, so... That, that, you know, even though people love to say the book, you know, the case is closed, it isn't. The case is open and uh, we're still learning more. So I know that your book obviously looks at the history of autism treatments, you know, from the, the horrible blaming of parents to the obviously, as you just said, the modern positive neurodiversity movement. So, you know, and I know that you also talk about the, the struggle to get a meaningful diagnostic criteria into the uh, DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I just wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, well, one of the, another thing that hardly anyone knows is that um, in the most recent edition of the DSM, uh, some autistic adults from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network uh, in America, were called upon to have input into the shaping of the diagnostic criteria. Uh, 
which I thought was excellent. And in fact, really the story of the last few years since Neurotribes has been published, and not, you know, obviously not only because of that, but an expression of the same cultural impulse, is that autistic people who were formerly left out of the societal conversations about autism are now having input. I remember when I started writing Neurotribes, um, if I would get a call, because I was blogging about autism as well, if I would get a call from a mainstream reporter, they would, you know, ask me a bunch of questions. And then I would say, have you talked to any autistic adults? And they would say, uh, well, uh, no, actually, you know, and uh, that outraged me eventually because it was like a million articles about feminism that only talked about men, you know, or <laughs> like, you know, hello, Mr. White guy. What do you think of black guys? You know, black lives matter, you know? So, um, so autistic people are now more routinely quoted in mainstream news stories about autism. So one of the wonderful accidental effects of the diagnosis being made available to adults, which is a process I describe in great depth in neurotribes, is that now people with autism can have input into the commentary on them and the framing of their condition and the framing of, of what they really struggle with. And, you know, what they really struggle with is not sitting in a room alone saying, oh, my God, I hate that I'm autistic. Or, you know, what, uh, what they really struggle with is not getting a fair shake in employment, in schooling, being condescended to, being dismissed, being socially rejected, being bullied when they're young. Those things cause much more suffering than the so-called symptoms of autism. And the world is really coming around to that recognition. So, Steve, so is autism on the rise? And, you know, where were the autistics in, in past generations? Oh, well, <laughs> they're in my book. The, the autistic in, in past generations were diagnosed. They, if you were white, you were diagnosed with something called childhood schizophrenia. Uh, as I talk about in my book, um, and that was in part because Leo Connor uh, mistakenly theorized that autism was the prodromal phrase of adult schizophrenia, that, that autistic kids would turn out to be adult schizophrenics. Well, that was wrong. Um, and uh, so basically you would be diagnosed with something called childhood schizophrenia, which is now considered to be extremely rare. The question is not only where were the autistics in previous generations, the question is where are the childhood schizophrenics who were filling mental institutions? Uh, in the 60s and 70s, because there was an epidemic of childhood schizophrenia in the 60s and 70s. And if you read, as I did, the accounts within these institutions, it's very, very clear that those people were autistic. Um, in fact, you could just swap out the two terms and, and it would read exactly the same. That's if you were lucky. That's if you were white, you would get diagnosed with childhood schizophrenia. If you were black, you would get diagnosed with intellectual disability or what they called at the time, mental retardation. And um, medical authorities talk about something called diagnostic substitution, which is that once a, a condition is more accurately recognized, the old term sort of goes away and then the new term comes into full force. And if you look at the figures of kids who are diagnosed with sort of generic intellectual disability, they have gone down while autism has gone up. And it's because of a process, a, a multiphasic process that I describe in the book, whereas basically autism became a label you could use. And so suddenly there are all these autistics, but they've been there all along, diagnosed with something else or not diagnosed at all and just considered really weird. I just wondered what you thought about um, public perception of what autism is, because I, I know where uh, you know, people think about the, you know, the movie The Rain Man back in the late 80s. And that was obviously at the time was instrumental in raising public awareness, awareness of what autism was. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about how that film came about and how media representation of autism has changed over the past 30 years. Well, um, before Rain Man, Autism was almost universally described as, and I'm quoting, uh, 
uh, something that a doctor told uh, some parents that I read about, uh, that autism was a fate worse than death. It's a fate worse than death, but you must learn to bear it. So why were, doc why were doctors saying that? It's because there was very little hope for autistic kids who ended up in institutions. There were no learning possibilities. They were put on, you know, experimental drugs, given lobotomies even, um, or electric shock therapy, or electric shock punishment. Um, it was uh, horrific, barbaric, uh, uh, an abattoir, you know, really. So, yes, for the people who ended up in institutions, uh, it was a fate worse than death, actually. But that wasn't autism. That was institutionalization. Um, and so Rain Man, you know, it's become kind of hip to look back at Rain Man and say, oh, it's what a stereotype. It's so oppressive. You know, Dustin Hoffman counting, counting toothpicks, counting cards like, oh, what, a, you know, what an oppressive stereotype. What people don't remember is that before Rain Man, autistic adults were completely invisible in society. There was no such thing. Remember that uh, at the beginning of Rain Man, uh, Raymond Babbitt, the character played by Dustin Hoffman, is in an institution. That's where he would have been. You would never have seen him, which meant that for young, uh, young autistics, there were no visible role models of successful adulthood. Um, for even the families of autistic kids, you know, they had to kind of work out that, oh, dear, you know, it's my child is now, my quote unquote child is now 40. You know, he's still obviously autistic. Autistic adults exist, you know, and the people who, who worked that out <clears throat> were people like Lorna Wing in England, who is not only a parent of a uh, uh, rather uh, significantly disabled daughter named Susie, but she was also uh, a cognitive psychiatrist. So she had both the experience of raising an autistic adult and the leverage to make that a subject of discussion among her colleagues. But um, I remember I spoke to a, uh, a scientist at UCLA, Ed Ridfo, a very uh, well-known scientist, and he wrote a paper. He wrote the very first paper about, uh, in fact, it was in the form of a letter to a journal um, about uh, Autistic adult people who had been diagnosed with autism when they were kids, who grew up uh, and then got married, got jobs, and had kids. And Ritvo told me that he was ridiculed by his peers uh, when that when that came out because people said, "What are you talking about? Autistic people can't they, they can't get married, they can't have kids, they can't hold jobs." You know. And now, of course, we know that in fact. Autistic employees can be extremely valuable to even like hyper ambitious, you know, Silicon Valley companies because they frame problems in their minds in different ways than neurotypical employees and can see solutions from different directions. Yeah. Um, so so those, yeah. those are the benefits that autistic people can bring to the rest of society. Yes, exactly. And in fact, I would say that one of the underlying themes of neurotribes is that the gifts and contributions of, um, you know, I'm not always saying people who would have gotten a diagnosis of autism, but people with autistic traits uh, have made enormous contributions to art, science, literature, uh, and research uh, in a million ways, in science fiction as well. It's clear that some of the early science fiction people were autistic, and they thought of themselves as weird or odd or you know, nerds more or less as, as they still do, you know. Um, uh, but they, but they were really dreaming our collective future. And, um, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that many of the changes, uh, that Silicon Valley and other communities like it have made in society with, uh, oh, asynchronous communication, uh, on screen communication. Many of those things really benefit people with autistic traits quite strikingly, and uh, they ended up benefiting all of us.
Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to 2015 now, Steve. So were you surprised to win the Samuel Johnson Prize and you were propelled into the position of autism guru and advocate for autistic rights? Well, uh, uh, let's strike the phrase autism guru. Uh, <laughs> I, am not, I am not any kind of guru, although I might look like one. Uh, but uh, No, I am not. Um, but I will say, I'll, I'll tell you something very inside and i've never said it in public and it's yeah. it's dishy is as uh oh, this is the first exclusive on my uh, <laughs> podcast <sorry. Yeah>. okay <laughs> i went to the samuel johnson prize awarding event which i was you know obviously extremely honored to be asked i went with a woman named saskia baron who has made um she's the daughter of a very well-known um uh autism parent He's the guy who founded the National Autistic Society in England, all right? So Saskia is his daughter. I went with her. Why? Because, A, I knew she'd be really fun and cheeky, and, B, I imagined I was about to lose, and it was going to be humiliating and embarrassing, and I wanted to be with someone who could, you know, make satiric, backbiting remarks when I lost, you know, and, and then I won. And, you know, I was like, once the once the, the head of the judges started describing the book that won, I thought to myself, that's weird. It sounds like my book, you know. Yeah. So I, I was completely surprised. I will say, this is a little bit uh, bitchy on my part. I will say I got, I got a payback a few months later um, because I <laughs> – I, uh, oh, two th actually, let me say this too. Um, so I won, you know, I was ecstatic. It was, you know, I was like, I felt like a rock star for three minutes. Um, but what's funny is that, so they cut me a check, right? They cut me a check. Yeah. And then like the next day or something, or two days later, the Brexit vote happened. By the, oh, gosh. By the time I got back to America, my check was worth thousands of dollars less. <laughs> Because of Brexit, you know, so Brexit immediately impacted me. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so um, the payback was that uh, I was invited to actually let's not single anyone out because uh, yeah. I may still be right. in the running, for, you know, <laughs> for, <laughs> for my next book. But so I went to a very, I was invited by a very large, you know, well-known organization in England because um, I was shortlisted for this their big prize. And uh, that was the opposite experience because I get there, I'm like holding some absurd bouquet or something. And then <laughs> lady whatnot or whatever of the, of the judges committee um, said something like, I have read Silverman's very long book. <laughs> and I thought, Jesus God, really? You know? So no, I didn't win that one. <laughs> so there you go that's an exclusive yeah. um, here on different Mind podcast series I yeah. love that Steve <laughs> yeah. so Steve so in terms of the, the, the term neurodiversity and, and obviously you know as you say I interviewed the, 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 the founder of that term Judy Singer a few weeks ago I, I know that you described that in a, in a, in a TED talk that you did as a, you, you, you said just because a PC is not running Windows doesn't doesn't mean that it's broken, and I just really like that that analogy that you gave there. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? Sure. It occurred to me that um, what certain forms of ableism were saying was that there was only one normal type of human mind, and everything else fell short. If you didn't meet this sort of platonic ideal of normalcy, you had deficits and dysfunctions. And, and those deficits and dysfunctions define you. Well, what if there isn't one type of human mind uh, that is, you know, the only type of human mind that is good? And that's something that we were learning in a lot of different ways. Like, for instance, the gay thing. You know, there isn't one type of sexual orientation that is clearly the best, clearly the most normal. There is a, there is a wide variety and there's a wide variety of gender identities. And, you know, we're learning about the multiplicity of, of the universe and of life on Earth. And in fact, you know, one might even say that, you know, this sort of uh, national freakout uh, 
that America is going through now with white supremacists marching in the streets is it's people fighting that recognition that in fact human life is diverse and various and that diversity and, and variousness help us as a society. They're not things standing in the way of progress. They enable progress. And so I would say that neurodiversity is the recognition that in communities of human minds, experience things differently, experiencing things differently, conceptualizing things differently, uh, being able to imagine things differently from some you know, phony, completely fictitious standard of normal is best for the future of civilization. And, you know, if we survive this horrific era, and many of us will not uh, in the most dramatic sense uh, because of COVID, but if however much we survive this era, um, the world is struggling towards a recognition of diversity as, as a good thing in uh, in society. And I hope we make it. No, absolutely. Yeah. And essentially, as you say, that's why neurodiversity is important for all of us, for all of humanity, essentially. Um, yeah, really interesting. Tell us, a, yeah, tell us a favorite story about your hero and former teacher. I believe that's poet Allen Ginsberg. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know, um, Allen Ginsberg was a poet um, who uh, he was probably the best known poet on earth for a while. Um, and he was part of what's called the Beat Generation. So the other, uh, his other colleagues in the Beat Generation were people like Jack Kerouac, who wrote a book called On the Road. Uh, and, you know, a million backpackers carried a copy of On the Road in their backpacks as they struck out for the woods or, you know, for India or whatever in the 60s. Um, both Ginsburg and Kerouac were sort of uh, almost like father figures in a way uh, to the hippie generation. Um, and so by the time I met Allen Ginsberg, uh, I was 19 and he was in his 50s, I think. And um, he was one of the most awake, articulate, um, compelling, energetic uh, middle-aged man that I'd ever seen. I, I'd never seen someone so alive, really, uh, particularly a man at that age. When I was 19, most middle-aged men seemed like robots to me. Like they just went to their jobs and they didn't feel much on the surface. And, you know, they seemed incapable of, uh, you know, loving one another. So I remember when I went to, uh, I went to Florence when I was like 20 or something. And uh, there was the passeggiata, which is the, you know, everyone takes a walk like after dinner. Um, and all these men were holding hands. And, you know, I turned to my friend and I said, are these gay men? You know? And he said, oh, shh. Don't say that they'll kill you. <laughs> and so, but you know, like American, American, you know, men thought of themselves as so hip. They couldn't, they, they were like terrified to hold the hand of their best friend, you know, in the street. And so Alan was just like very open about being gay, very open about taking psychedelics, uh, very open about, uh, having spiritual interests in Buddhism and, and, uh, other forms of religion, um, being very against this uh, totally inhumane capitalistic society, uh, which has reached its apotheosis under Trump, I must say. Um, and Alan wrote a poem called Howl in the late 50s that was like a, cr a, a cry of defiance heard round the world and heard by people uh, who then went on to become their own significant cultural forces like Bob Dylan uh, and many other people, Patti Smith. Um, like every generation of insurgents, really, uh, that followed the beats has cited them as an influence, including the punks. So um, uh, the punks loved Burroughs, who I also knew. So, um, you know, Alan was, uh, he, I, he was not a saint. I had problems with some of the things that he did, but he was, um, he was very uh, alive. And he, I remember he was an enormous force for, community and for encouraging people to see each other as full human beings. And one of the biggest influences on neurotribes, which I only rarely uh, get to mention, is Alan. Uh, Alan's famous for writing Howl, but uh, there's another poem of his that I actually think is even better uh, called Kaddish, which was, uh, Kaddish is the Jewish prayer for the dead. And 
Ellen's mother was had schizophrenia, and she was institutionalized. And uh, in fact, tragically, Ellen was uh, because there was a divorce going on with his parents. Ellen was forced to sign a permission form for a lobotomy for his mother that killed her. So, uh, and he was a teenager at the time. So, Ellen knew very well the the horrific nature of mental institutions because he had gone to visit his mother there. And so Kaddish is actually a triumphant anthem standing up for the humanity of people in mental institutions, junkies, gay people, people of color, uh, for people who've been left out of society. And so really one of the the primary influences behind Neurotribes was Kaddish and I only wish he'd uh, he died in the late in the late nineties. I only wish he'd lived long enough to see his former dorky teenage fanboy uh, write a New York Times bestseller. Uh, uh, it, it, that would have been fun. Steve, what are the challenges we face then as a society in terms of the future of neurodiversity? And you know, how do we how do we best help with shifting the discourse away from you know cure talk when it comes to autism and and towards more acceptance and and an inclusion of autistic people well um for one thing you know it's it's great that you know neurodiversity is sort of on the on everyone's lips you know like there was a there was an article in the Harvard Business Review on the cover uh touting the virtues of neurodiversity that's great I'm not you know, denigrating that at all. It's exactly how societal change happens. But the question is, is this just, you know, sort of high, big ticket companies hiring a few autistic people to do basically nothing, you know, so that they can say, oh, we're, you know, we're promoting neurodiversity. And so like the, oftentimes a block that autistic people face in hiring is that, Companies, uh, you know, in places like Silicon Valley look for, quote unquote, team players, you know. And when I talk to recruiters from those companies, I say, well, what do you look for in a potential employee? And they say, well, we look for, you know, people who are like us, you know, and I could say, oh, you mean young, handsome, gym going, white, f-ing neurotypical, <laughs> you know, it's like people like us, you know, that's it's. It's quite limiting, you know. <laughs> um, in fact, you should be looking for people not like you, actually, you know. And so, so that's a that you know. And uh, a guy um, who uh, works for a, ger- a big German software conglomerate named Jose Velasco, who runs a a um, program called Autism at Work, that's one of the most viable and and effective um, uh, employment efforts. Uh, for autistic people, um, he pointed out to me that sort of the the go to tips for uh, prevailing in an interview is like a list of things that uh, many autistic people find difficult to do. You know, make strong eye contact, firm handshake, sell yourself. You know, <laughs> these are all these are all really difficult things to do. So based on based on a model developed by a company called Specialistern, um, which was started by a dad, a wonderful guy who has an autistic kid. Um, they figured out different ways of enabling potential employees to demonstrate their competence and their eagerness to join a team. So like they would have um, potential programmers demonstrate their skills in solving problems with Lego because Lego is uh, it's one of those things that a lot of autistic people like to do and enjoy doing. So instead of saying, sit there and make eye contact with the stranger, even though eye contact is physically painful for you, you know, they say like, go to that table and solve this problem with Lego, you know, and, and the, you know, the, the uh, potential employees can rise to the top. And we're also learning how to accommodate employees in the workplace uh, by providing stuff like, um, Quiet rooms where they can chill out if they if they get overwhelmed uh, sensorily, uh, and also peer support groups. Uh, I attended. A, there's an online payment company called Square, and I got uh, invited to talk with an autistic man named John Marble uh, 
uh, to an employee neurodiversity support group. Neurodiversity support groups are also uh, flourishing at colleges. And so that's really important because then you can have, you know, seniors who have already figured out how to get the accommodations they need uh, in a particular school able to coach freshmen who are neurodivergent on what to ask for and how to get it. And then uh, after that, uh, people can help mental mentor each other into the workplace from, from school. So all these neurodiversity support groups and, you know, peer support groups, we're not talking about like some neurotypical counselor, you know, being paid to give advice to students. We're talking about other neurotypical peers being able to support everybody in the room. Uh, those are really important steps forward that society is taking. Do, do you think it's still the case that a lot of autistic people are still masking their autistic traits to try and fit into a new, you know, neurotypical world? Oh, absolutely. And it's exhausting for them, you know. Um, basically, you know, because everyone is not red neurotrites or whatever. You know, it's like people, you know, kids still get bullied. Employees still get whispered about at the coffee machine. Um, you know, people still, uh, you know, avoid dating. So, you know, someone, oh, there's something wrong there. Well, actually, there's something right there. They're autistic and they're acting that way and they trust you enough to show you, you know. Um, and uh, so it's, I'm not saying that this is all going to happen overnight or that it's all already happened or something. It hasn't. At least we're on the right path uh, towards great inclusion. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to finish with a question that I ask all my podcast guests. And I wondered if you had a chance, Steve, what advice would you give to your younger self? Don't worry so much. You're not, um, don't worry so much about being in exile from humanity because you fall in love with your male best friends. It doesn't mean that you're doomed, it means that you're gay. And in fact, you're going to find the most wonderful husband eventually. Uh, in fact, my, my husband is teaching in the other room on Zoom now um, because, thank God, he's not being forced to go into, uh, you know, the slaughterhouse that, that American schools have become. Um, and, uh, boy, like, he's awesome. And, you know, I mean, I, I was literally suicidal often when I was a teenager because I thought I was the one cast out of humanity. You know, I was so weird and I'm always falling in love with the wrong people. Well, it just took the right person to convince me that I'm fine. And do you think, Steve, that's an interesting point there. Do you think that, you know, obviously you being gay, do you think that's how you've, you've been able to identify with the cause that the autistic people face in being different, essentially? I would absolutely say that. And um, uh, for one thing, I felt like, an, an uh, you know, a, an outsider my whole life, um, even an outsider in certain gay communities, like I'm, you know, when I'm with a uh, very upper class, you know, <laughs> bourgeois, you know, gays who seem to think about nothing but the latest divas on Spotify. And, you know, I, like, I don't relate to them either. Like, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a perpetual outsider. And uh, I have a lot of autistic friends now. Um, and uh, they often feel like perpetual outsiders. And I think that was what made me question the medical model even back in 2001. And that's also why I'm still making autistic friends now. Really interesting. So where can uh, listeners find out more about the work that, you, that you're that you up to, Steve? Do you have your own website? I do. Steve Silberman with a B, S, uh, S-T-E-V-E-S-I-L-B as in boy, dot com. Uh, sorry, B as in boy, E-R-M-A-N dot com. There I talk about my next book, The Taste of Salt which is going to be a history of cystic fibrosis, which has very different issues but uh, associated with it than autism, but is also a fascinating story, and I'm well into the research for that. And then if you just – I'm, I'm so Googleable, it's scary. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you Google Steve Silverman autism or Steve Silverman beat generation or Steve Silverman grateful dead, because I was also a big deadhead, uh, there's more stuff than you could ever want to read. Brilliant. Well, Steve, thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor talking to you. Oh, it's been an honor to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for your interest, John. <laughs>
Thank you. And as you say, if we could get to a situation where there was more acceptance, then you know, autistic people wouldn't have to do the masking that we talked about. And ultimately, the, we can appreciate them for who they who they really are. And, and obviously, the, as you say, the enormous contribution that they make to society as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely.